Salam sejahtera anda bersama saya Rizal Zulkapli dan ini Niaga Awani kita mulakan dengan perkembangan pasaran dan juga data ekonomi serantau. Saham di Asia Pasifik didagangkan rendah dengan pelabur menantikan data PMI China yang akan diumumkan pagi ini. Data PMI China yang diumumkan sebelum ini tunjukkan penurunan. Sementara itu terkini PMI IHS Market Malaysia untuk sektor pembuatan jatuh kepada 39.9 mata pada Jun daripada sekitar 51 mata pada Mei. Sebarang angka di bawah 50 menandai dekan penguncupan dan kami akan bawakan perkembangan tersebut dalam jam-jam akan datang. Sementara itu saham di pasaran Amerika mencatatkan peningkatan dengan pelabur mengakhiri dagangan Jun dengan dan suku kedua dengan data ekonomi positif. Antara yang dinantikan seterusnya pelabur adalah data pekerjaan di Amerika yang akan diumum pada Jumaat. Pada penutup indeks S&P 500 naik 5 mata, Dow Jones naik 210 mata dan juga Nasdaq jatuh 24 mata. Kesemua indeks ini meningkat untuk 5 sekuan berturut-turut dengan S&P 500 naik 8.2%, Nasdaq naik 9.5% dan juga Dow Jones naik 4.6%. Pemerhati melihat S&P 500 yang telah naik 14% sepanjang tahun ini menandakan pasaran sedang alami rally. Tambahnya pelabur kini melihat kembali kepada saham pertumbuhan selepas kenyataan Jerome Powell yang menjangka kadar inflasi tinggi semasa di Amerika adalah sementara. Seterusnya, Presiden Joe Biden menandatangani tiga undang-undang yang menamatkan apa yang telah diluluskan oleh Presiden Donald Trump. Undang-undang ini termasuk berkenaan had kadar faedah peminjam jangka pendek menghadkan pelepasan gas rumah hijau dalam aktiviti cari gali syarikat minyak dan gas dan juga cara penyelesaian tuntutan dalam suruhanjaya peluang pekerjaan saksama. Menurut Joe Biden, ini adalah selari dengan tanggungjawab untuk bawa kebaikan bersama di bawah Presiden Trump, peminjam jangka pendek ke kepada pengguna dibenarkan mengenakan kadar faedah lebih tinggi daripada undang-undang negeri. Ini selalunya mengakibatkan pengguna membayar kos yang sangat tinggi untuk mendapatkan pinjaman untuk tampung sehingga hari gaji. Yayasan Bill and Melinda Gates umum akan belanjakan 2.1 bilion dolar untuk meningkatkan kesaksamaan gender. Pengumuman dalam sidang kemuncak kesaksamaan PBB di Paris. Dalam masa yang sama, Melinda Gates turut akan mendermakan 1.4 bilion dolar untuk hak kesihatan seksual dan juga reproduktif wanita. Dana ini akan dibelanjakan dalam masa lima tahun dan turut merangkumi program memperkasakan ekonomi dan inisiatif lain. Sidang kemuncak berkenaan turut menyaksikan penyumbang swasta kerajaan dan NGO bergabung untuk membuat komitmen kewangan dan politik untuk kesaksamaan gender. Seterusnya, perkongsian ekonomi komprehensif serantau RCEP boleh menjadi instrumen pemulihan ekonomi penting terhadap pandemik COVID-19 menurut bekas Duta Kepertubuhan Perdagangan Dunia Datuk M. Supramaniam. Jika dilaksanakan dengan berkesan RCEP dapat mengukuhkan kedudukan Malaysia di peringkat global yang boleh menjadi elemen penting kepada pemulihan. Menurutnya apabila berkuat kuasa, ia akan menghapuskan tarif sebanyak 90% daripada barangan yang didagangkan antara penanda tangannya dalam tempoh 20 tahun akan datang. Beliau membuat kenyataan berkenaan pada seminar siri Meju Bulat Dewan Perniagaan Malaysia China RCEP secara maya. Supramania menjelaskan bahawa RCEP akan memperluas perdagangan antara rantau, mengintegrasikan rantai yang bekalan dan menggalakkan ketelusan. Beliau berkata RCEP akan turut meningkatkan peluang komersial dan kerjasama strategik antara negara-negara anggota untuk meninjau peluang perniagaan. Menurut beliau, ratifikasi RCEP akan menunjukkan Malaysia ingin menjalankan perniagaan dengan negara-negara lain walaupun berdepan dengan situasi COVID-19. RCEP adalah perjanjian perdagangan bebas terbesar di dunia dengan menghimpunkan 10 negara anggota ASEAN dan Jepun, China, Korea Selatan, Australia dan New Zealand. Setakat ini, Singapura, Thailand, China dan Jepun telah meratifikasi perjanjian RCEP. Malaysia dijangka meratifikasi RCEP pada akhir tahun ini atau selewat-lewatnya pada suku pertama 2022. Seterusnya, dasar yang ditambah baik bagi keterangkuman dan tabir urus digital diperlukan untuk melonjakkan perjalanan transformasi digital Malaysia. Menerusi buku terkininya Network Nation, Navigating Challenges, Realizing Opportunities of Digital Transformation, Kazanah Research Institute menawarkan pelbagai cadangan dasar khusus. Antara prinsip yang dicadangkan adalah meningkatkan kerjasama di seluruh institusi utama dan mengadakan libat urus dengan pihak pendukung kepentingan awam ke arah matlamat keterangkuman. 
Tambahnya rangka kerja dasar digital menyeluruh perlu diwujudkan. Prinsip lain ialah mempertingkatkan pendidikan awam dan celik digital di semua peringkat untuk melancarkan transformasi digital Malaysia. Buku itu juga menunjukkan bagaimana keterangkuman digital sebagai sasaran dasar bergerak yang berkembang seiring dengan evolusi teknologi. Untuk membincangkan berkenaan penerbitan tersebut, kita bersama penyelidik Network Nation dan juga penyelidik kanan Khazanah Research Institute Dr. Rachel Gong. Uh, Doctor, thank you for joining us. Doctor, uh, first of all, the book Network Nation, Navigating Challenges, uh, Realizing Opportunities of uh, Digital Transformation is a compilation of eight papers uh, published by KRI from September 2020 to April 2021. Tell us the most worrying trend when it comes to digitalization that you have observed during this period. Yes, good morning, Rizal. Uh, thanks for having me. I think actually one of the most worrying trends that I have observed is that we seem to be moving quite quickly into digitalization without enough long-term planning. Uh, what I mean here is that we have correctly realized that digital is the way forward, mm -hmm. but we are not taking enough systematic stock of where we are and what existing gaps need to be filled and how we can avoid or at least minimize these gaps reappearing in the future. Mm -hmm. So we are very much focused on, oh, there's an app for that, that's the solution. And we are not giving enough attention to how much the introduction of these technologies will have different impacts on different parts of society. Mm -hmm. So the book, which people can find um, on KRI's website, addresses this concern by looking at two connected themes of digitalization. First, it looks at issues of digital inclusion and where some people might not be benefiting fully from digitalization. So inclusion is about making sure that any, everyone can benefit from digital technologies and it's about more than just improving infrastructure and lowering the cost of data. Mm -hmm. We can often talk about Malaysia is mobile first, there's a lot of uh, SIM, uh, SIM card subscriptions, but it isn't all that meaningful when you consider, uh, for example, that people work and they learn better when they have PCs or tablets compared to phones. Mm -hmm. So an MOE study, for example, showed that fewer than 10% of, of students have a PC or a tablet. And that means a lot of them are actually being left behind even when we do have good infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So digital inclusion is one issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the second focus of the book is digital governance. We can see how digital data and machine learning are going to be a big part of our lives. And there are a lot of initiatives to take on 5G and, and cloud computing and you know later on uh, IR 4.0. But there doesn't seem to be a lot of attention given to the details of, uh, for example, interoperability. Mm -hmm. How all these systems will work with each other without also increasing the risk of data breach or ransomware. Mm -hmm. So even if you assume that for cybersecurity, uh, we have put in technical defenses, uh, good encryption, uh, multi-factor authentication, all that, the weak link is still the, the human factor, the social factor. Mm -hmm. So if we over-focus on the technical system, even if we look at things like uh, what are the redundancy measures to make sure that we have a backup system. For example, you see like when people were trying to sign up for the AstraZeneca vaccine and mm -hmm. the website couldn't support it. Mm -hmm. right? What are the things that we are doing to make sure that we have um, reliable systems like that? What are we doing to make sure that the data that is being used for artificial intelligence is not biased any, any, against any particular group? Mm -hmm. um, what do we do to prevent you know, vocal groups on social media from distorting the political landscape? But we also have to make sure that people that um, may be underrepresented or don't have a voice have a safe space where they can speak up. Uh, Dr. So, Mm. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, doc uh, Doctor. But Doctor, um, uh, on top of that, are we still discussing the urban-rural divide and access to connection? I mean, access and connection, uh, these two things have been discussed over and over again uh, these past 13 months. And um, how is this, uh, zooming in, how is this affecting the quality of life for people, students living in the rural area? And what could happen if this is not addressed properly? Right. I think, again, so this is the issue where we 
I think, have no disagreement on the high level, you know, the, the sort of broad policy of, of course, we must improve access and connectivity. But where I think we need to go one step further is we need to look at what is meaningful connectivity, mm. right? The issue is in the details. So let's take Jandela, right? Jandela's plan is to increase 4G coverage from 91.8% to 96.9% and increase mobile broadband speed from 25 uh, megabytes per second to 35 by 2022. But when you consider what is actually uh, Machi Pachi in the Kampong using um, internet for, mm. are they going to, going to notice these improvements? Is it really going to benefit them? Mm. Right? So you consider the small businesses uh, who would benefit from r fast and reliable internet connection, especially in rural areas. They're trying to do e-commerce that can serve um, urban areas. They need to have fast and reliable internet connection mm -hmm. so that they can transfer data or process data and all that. But the challenge here is have enough of them uh, digitalized and set up the systems that would mm -hmm. allow them to benefit from the improved infrastructure of Jandela. Mm -hmm. Same thing you, you point out for students. Uh, of course, it would be better if they had more data. Um, and they had, uh, you know, they were able to stream their lectures and have their discussion groups and all that, but they don't have good devices. Mm -hmm. So you have the infrastructure, but we need to go further. And, and do Doctor, uh, the digital gender gap uh, is widening. I think this is according to a st uh, statement uh, produced by Kazana Research Institute. The digital gender gap is widening with the proportion of internet users who are women decreasing from 43.6% to 41% between 2012 and 2018. What happened there? That's a really, really good question you raise. Uh, something we do need to look into more detail because the data is not granular enough to allow us to dig into where the gaps have changed. So, for example, what we have are these national level statistics and really what we need to do is go down deeper into that urban-rural breakdown you were mm -hmm. describing. Maybe it's also something to do with uh, education or income levels, we can't tell. Mm -hmm. But one thing we did find uh, that we discussed in the Network Nation book is that although uh, more women than men sign up, they register for digital platform work, it's actually more men than women that are actively searching for these kinds of work. Mm -hmm. So it reinforces the point that for digital inclusion, we cannot just look at one, uh, one high-level measure, uh, how many people register. We also need to dig deeper into who's actually using these digital tools, who's actually benefiting, and when we do that, we find that there is a gender divide. Mm -hmm. and, and Doctor, many companies were forced to adopt uh, digitalization last year. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and what can companies do now to um, train their employees better? And are these trainings uh, or training uh, being carried out uh, effectively? Do companies know the skills, the right skills needed for their employees? I think here you're asking exactly the right questions because um, I think given, okay, so although digitalization uh, was going very quickly last mm -hmm. year and a lot of businesses had to um, move very quickly to pivot to um, e-commerce and to pivot to accepting e-payments and things like that, mm -hmm. but because of the open-close, open-close uh, nature of the different MCOs, it meant that it was actually very challenging for an SME to sit back and, and you know, assess exactly what do I need um, for digitalization? Where am I going to benefit the most? Is it going to be worth the investment? Um, how many workers, uh, what kind of skills do they need uh, in order to do this? What incentives are available? What initiatives and how to do all this? Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone is surprised to hear that you know, our research will show that one in two SMEs site that costs and skills are the barrier. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more outreach and communication on the part of government agencies needs to be done to reach the SMEs. So I know we see a lot of advertisements and publicity uh, in newspapers, in social media, but the key here is really, I think, um, mm -hmm. long-term sustained education and engagement at the local community level.
So we need to be empowering local authorities, NGOs. Um, you know, there are people who are willing to consult, uh, digital experts who are willing to give advice to really get SMEs to uh, get into digital adoption and digital technology. Uh, Doctor, and also um, I, I believe the government has urged SMEs uh, to adopt e-commerce. Uh, I think that is the easiest way for them to reach their customers during this uh, lockdown period. But again, it's e-commerce for everyone. And how can these SMEs skill up and do more perhaps complex digital transformation? Or do they even need to do complex digital transformation? Very, uh, that's, that's exactly uh, the point I think that we would want to raise and consider because if you look at e-commerce, right, mm -hmm. uh, and this is an area that, there, like, as you say, there really has been a lot of effort put into and it has helped a lot of businesses. But when you look at the global trends, statistics for 2020 show that there is only one country in the world where e-commerce makes up over 50% of retail sales, mm -hmm. and that's China, mm -hmm. right? Uh, largely driven by their e-payments and how everything is cashless. Mm -hmm. But everywhere else, literally every other country, brick and mortar sales are still dominant, mm. even under lockdown. And the expectation is that that's where people will want to go back to when the pandemic conditions are uh, dealt with and people start to society starts to open back up. So we really do have to look at, okay, besides e-commerce, the front-end customer-facing side of digitalization, what can we do at the back end? Things mm -hmm. like inventory, accounting, um, you know, uh, the supply chain, and how, where does digitalization come in there? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Doctor, uh, my final question is, as a nation uh, with so many smartphone users and high internet penetration, I think, I believe a lot of Southeast Asian countries, they have these similar trends. Uh, what, what potentials do you see for Malaysia? There's so, I mean, Malaysia has got such great potential. Uh, there's lots of fields where we can really, uh, you know, take on technology to improve productivity. Agritech, for example. Um, edutech, education tech, uh, healthcare. But I think the heart of what we are trying to point out with the research that we've done is that in order for these new technologies to really benefit all of society, uh, it's not just about finding the technology, finding the app, uh, developing systems. That we need to really develop the people as well. Right? So these social techni technical issues are not just solved by technical solutions, but by social solutions. And that means we do have to focus on building blocks like education, uh, human rights, equity of opportunity. And that's the way that we're actually going to um, help push the nation forward, as, as the DEB, the Digital Economic Blueprint puts it, to become a digitally driven, high-income nation and a regional leader. On that note, we thank you very much, Dr. Rachel Gong, uh, Penelidik Network Nation dan juga Penelidik Kanan Kazanah Research Institute yang memberikan penangan berkenaan dengan buku Network Nation yang diterbitkan oleh Kazanah Research Institute. Kita akan berhenti berehat seketika kembali selepas ini.